Hello and welcome to Getting Candid with me, your girl Helen. I hope you guys have been inviting your friends to subscribe to the channel and enjoy the show because I think it's really selfish of you to just be watching these conversations on your own. There's so much fun that we have here. There's so much to learn. And today's interview is just about that. I think we are going to learn so much and get inspired because I'm chatting with the, the Damon TV CEO, Mr. Costa Monza, guys. I am honored, I won't lie, I'm honored and excited because this is a man who we all know for having great interviews. He is one of the best interviewers that we've had in the country. So let me join him on the other side as I chat with him and also remember Dark Beauty by Sonica made me look this good. Alrighty, welcome back. I mentioned that I'll be chatting with one of, I don't know how to call it, legends, mentors in the media industry in Zambia. How are you, Mr. Costa Mwansa? Helen, it's a pleasure to be hosted on your show. Uh, I'm very well, and yeah. uh, I don't know whether legend befits uh, that introduction. Yeah. Uh, I still consider myself a practitioner in the industry, uh, except that uh, I may have seen more years in the business than <laughs> other colleagues practicing, but there's still more yeah. who I call legends, the Frank Mutubilas, the innocent yeah. Kalalukas, and so on. But I, I'm humbled to be on your show. I'm excited to have you on the show and uh, I think I was telling my friends, look here, this is going to be one of the hardest interviews I have to do because this is a man who handles interviews like, <laughs> <laughs> like nobody in the industry. Well, I think, you know, the feeling is surreal because uh, I often uh, do not take interviews. I love sitting in the position where you're at. Uh, yeah. uh, it's easier to ask the questions than to answer the questions. <laughs> so I hope uh, I'll be equal to the task. But... Uh, We've been having busy schedules, you and me, and it's, it's only good enough that finally this interview finally, has happened. Finally, yeah. finally. Yeah. Anyway, let's get into it. So firstly, before we, get, we even get into the media questions, one thing I would, I would like to know is, uh, were you born and bred in Lusaka? No, definitely not. Uh, I, I don't believe that people who are born and first of all, Lusaka in itself is a town full of immigrants. I mean, yeah. Everybody has come to the city to make ends meet. Uh, so probably inhabitants of Lusaka themselves uh, could call themselves you Lusaka people. I'm born and bred on the Copper Belt, um, okay. so that's where you understand uh, where all the aggression comes from. Yes. We, it can only be Copper, so <laughs> no, not Lusaka. Okay, is your family, some parts of your family still in, in, in Copper Belt? Or? Yes, um, my mom um, uh, still stays uh, on the Copper Belt in Kalushi, to be particular, that's where I was born. Uh, I went to school in primary there. Uh, I've got an elder brother still living there, so I'm rooted there. Um, I've put up a bit of properties there as well, just okay. to support you know the community. Yeah. Um, doing some some work uh, around giving back to the community around there. So family still there. Mm -hmm. uh, extended family dotted around, you know, Muflira, you know, Kitu, and so on. Uh, so still in, in, in very constant touch with my roots on the Copper Belt. Okay, you moved to Lusaka, was it because of school or...? Lusaka, like I'm saying, uh, basically is, is, is the big city. Uh, obviously, we are now trying to look at aspects of decentralization and saying uh, Lusaka is not Zambia. But uh, when I finished my uh, secondary school at Mukuba Boys, um, just uh, early into the 2000s, I came uh, obviously to Lusaka to pursue um, my career. I wanted to be a radio host or a DJ then because I'd started doing that while on the Copper Belt. Uh, obviously I enrolled into tertiary education under Evelyn Horn College and at that time I used to do part-time jobs on um, you know, Choice FM then uh, at Findeco House. I used to do a few gigs um, in North Mid, Zenon, Boom Boom Room and so on. So basically uh, it was trying to get platforms that can give one an opportunity to further uh, their passion. So school uh, and obviously uh, platforms to foster my, my media career. That's, that's the whole reason why I had to travel into Lusaka because you couldn't get those big platforms on the mm -hmm. Copper Belt. Was it, uh, many people would tell you, you know, my parents didn't want to join, didn't want me to be in, uh, in the media. Was it the same case for you or maybe you were supported from the onset? Well, I mean, growing up, uh, all of us, when we're young, uh, have so many dreams. Um, I, I kid you not, but if you, if you spoke to people like Jacob Mlenga, who uh, has played professional football, 
he would tell you that his odds were that I would be a professional footballer once upon a time because I played very active football okay. uh, as, as a young boy with the likes of Jacob. Um, and w when we meet, he, he says I was better than him as, 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 as a boy. So maybe football. Um, my father was very staunch um, uh, SDA. He was an elder in the church. Um, we sang as a, as a family choir in church. Probably uh, my early media exposure was in church because my father would love us to read and, and, and present Bible verses before a congregation. Um, but after my father passed on when I was eight, I, I would have never known maybe what my father would have influenced me to be because he was a minor and generational uh, inheritance within the copper belt obviously looks at your grandfather, your father and everybody going turning into the mines. But my media passion was more influenced out of music uh, through you know brothers around me, uh, we listened to a lot of you know music uh, on tapes and and, and so on. Um, watched a lot of black and white TV. Um, so when I saw shows like Vibe uh, with Sinbad, later on you know things like you know Smooth Talk started, Frank Talk in itself, uh, and generally just you know journalism around. I participated in a lot of. Uh, school concerts then and it gave me a lot of confidence in public speaking um, when Radio Echengelo came up um, I joined the, the, the fan club then um, <clears throat> Radio Phoenix was formed uh, they stretched the, the, their broadcast wings onto the Copperfield so I grew up listening to people like K-Smash, KT, yeah. The Desire, Chilulemba, uh, you know, uh, Gesh um, and, and I started interacting with most of these people uh, actually from the Copper Belt end. Uh, most of the times when the 100% hit squad would have all these gigs uh, on the Copper Belt, I'd be you know, chaperoning most of them, putting up flowers before they came to the Copper Belt. Uh, if you talk about the likes of New Edge, Kelvin, Mwesa, JK, then uh, I remember still being in secondary school and I would promote um, shows for them at Cinderella Nightclub then. Uh, talk of the town, we used to call it Tots in Kitwe. So th there was this interaction between music, uh, me being a presenter. So um, the passion started, you know, uh, during my school days. It's only when I came into Lusaka that uh, obviously I honed that into a professional career um, through journalism. Um, though that was not the first course I did, landing into journalism was sort of uh, a fateful event. Um, okay. Sure, I'll tell that story one day. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I would like to know that story because I understand now that you've mentioned that you you also studied law, right? So with in the most recent past. Okay. So so so, 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 so when I when I enrolled when I completed secondary school, you know, you obviously wait that one year before you get your results and choose what what you want. Yeah. It was very clear for me at that point in time. Um, <clears throat> my mom uh, and and the rest of my family, my older brother. I was very sure that I wanted to pursue journalism at Evelyn Horn College. Obviously, at that point, it was a diploma. Sadly enough, um, by the time I was applying, there were no spaces in journalism school, and um, I needed to get into school. So I ended up enrolling under business studies okay. for human resource management, uh, which is not something I wanted to do, but I, I had to get into school. Uh, fate as it would have it um, towards the end of the year around I think November mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks or a month before the exam I mean I'd gone through human resource level one um, for one solid you know sep uh, like you know term, term year, yeah um, and wrote for the exam and then auditions came up for a campus radio called Horn FM that was coming up um, I went for those auditions, made it, but the, the, the rule was that for you to be on this campus radio, you needed to be a journalism student, and I was not. So I had to choose between dropping out of business school mm -hmm. to start afresh as a first year student the, the coming year and miss my exam, uh, which I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of people, many who I meet nowadays, and we laugh about this really made fun of me um, and didn't understand why somebody would leave business school and, and human resource and go 
as they called it, be a DJ. Yeah. So I, I lost one full year of my college uh, education. What did your parents say about that? My mom never knew that I did that. She never <laughs> oh, knew because okay. uh, being raised <clears throat> by a single mom, resources were limited. Yeah. Uh, I had a sibling coming after me. So I was resolved that um, I'll do everything in my power um, when um, I reached what would be the third, the fourth year to pay for myself because I didn't want my mom to take responsibility over my own choices and actions. And uh, thank God it worked out that well. By the time I was reaching second, third year of my journalism, I was earning enough money uh, not only to pay for my school fees, but to even uh, buy myself a car and, and, and other accessories. Nice. Yeah. Where, where was your father? You mentioned uh, being raised by a single... My father had passed on at the age uh, w um, uh, when I was only eight okay. years old. So I, I lost my father when I was only in grade two. Uh, so I've been brought up by my mom, who's uh, uh, alive, thank God. Um, she has influenced me in, in, in many areas. She, she retired now. She, she was a teacher, but she's running her own uh, private um, education business uh, back home. So, yeah, that's, that's how the road to, to that journalism and coming out of business That school. was a risk, but a good risk. It was a risk. But, I mean, my family supported, my mom supported. The, the initial plan was that I was supposed to go into journalism school. It was only space. Yeah. Um, if I didn't take that risk, and, and obviously, uh, I, I always say this to a lot of young people, uh, for you to get the good things in life, you need to go through a lot of painful situations. It's, it's, it's only when you go through the storm that uh, calmness or, or, or the storm will wither for you to get things. Simple things usually don't give good results. Okay. So a risk, but worthwhile. Nice. Yeah. Was movie TV your first TV job? Yes, it was. Um, again, at the time that I was in, 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 in college, um, there were no many private TV stations, apart from, obviously, the national broadcaster then. Mm -hmm. um, I think Cassat was the only thing it had closed then. Uh, there was a bit of Moby, but movie came up then. Um, I had to make a decision for my um, internship or industrial attachment, as we called it then. There were choices of me wanting to pursue either a PR internship with a corporate, mm -hmm. but uh, <clears throat> my lecturers and people I'd worked with very closely at um, Horn Radio then said I'd done, you know, a radio presentation since the inception of, of the radio station and felt it was a chance for me maybe to try and venture into TV and see how it works. Okay, yeah. nice. So how was it uh, like uh, when, when you got in there? Just tell us how the mood was. First day you're excited, obviously, doing TV. How mm. was it? Well, during my internship, there was nothing really exciting because you're a student and you're going to learn. Obviously, we were privileged in that, uh, apart from Horn FM radio, uh, the NORAD, um, that is the Norwegian sponsorship to uh, Evelyn Horn and the journalism faculty, uh, enabled uh, practical lessons of not just radio but TV. So we had a fully fledged TV studio, and <clears throat> once in a while I would accompany uh, the TV crew to shoot documentaries and so on. So I had a bit of an idea in terms of what it takes for TV production, how to script, and so on. Um, I had not just done a lot of active TV presentation. So going into uh, movie TV then, they were on UHF, so you had a lot of guys like Biklon and Difficulty, uh, people like Mutinta Chiseko, Mutolo Mwamba and them. Uh, so I never went on to TV for the first two years. Okay. Um, I was mainly on attachment in the newsroom. I met guys like, you know, Brian Mwale, we called him OG Snooks there. And then <laughs> um, Frank Sibuku as a young camera person, uh, Gerald Singwa is now with ZNBC and th th there was all this movement. Uh, Tom Njovu was Limbikani in Banja then, the likes of Daddy Chitalu, Angel Pui. So you had this house full of creatives and I was a bit timid then and really just in the corner watching and observing and, and really learning. Um, but during that internship uh, period, um, <clears throat> Movie TV partnered with some uh, Dutch organization called Free Voice and there came an opportunity for a project called um, Z Kids News. So here was a project for trained adult journalists who were being mentored 
on how to prepare news bulletins for young people. So psychological understanding of how to interview young people. How do you break down a big <coughs> news piece, sorry, like an election for young people to understand. At that point, that's where I met, you know, colleagues like uh, Lulu Hangala, now Lulu Wood, uh, Katenekwa Matunduelo, uh, and a whole host of people that I worked with. Uh, and eventually, um, as I was graduating uh, from Evelyn Horn, uh, I had already established myself with a movie brand, uh, presenting Z Kids News, but also doubling in the main newsroom, um, working on the business you know, desk. Uh, eventually, uh, I started presenting quite a number of programs from the Kids News, uh, a few entertainment shows, and I, I started becoming an all-rounder, breakfast shows and so on. But it took me two years, uh, you can imagine, to sit on the news desk, two years to go on the big screen because uh, my colleagues at that point felt I was too small. Yeah. So every time I want to sit on the news desk, they'll have to put two cushions <laughs> on the chair for me to just oh my God. reach the camera yeah. level. Yeah, and we, when we look back, we, we, we joke about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you eventually make partner at Movie TV? Were you a partner? Never. Oh, so the stories that we heard about you being a partner at Movie TV were just... Don't believe everything you hear on the street. <laughs> okay. uh, I was I was never partner. I I joined as an intern. Um, rose from being a single cab reporter to a kids news reporter to eventually news and managing editor and finally uh, general manager till the time I left. Nice. So now the, a lot of things were said uh, about uh, movie TV. A lot of people started complaining, you know, the salaries, the treatment. And uh, for some of the people that uh, you worked with at movie TV were saying you were very vulgar towards your colleagues. Mm. But which is, for me, I'm asking this question because it's like the total opposite that you hear from the people that are under you right now here at Damon TV. Is there some truth from the movie TV guys or? Well, just like I said in my previous answer, I don't know whether those assertions are fact or they're just, you know, uh, rumors. Uh, I don't know what, 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 what vulgar means or mistreatment and salaries, but I believe, to be honest, at this point, um, I'm running an outfit that is different from my previous job. Yeah. Um, so I cannot speak uh, for movie, but one thing I know, I mean, I spent lots of years there. Uh, if, 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 if at all there was anything of mistreating people and salaries, then people should have reported those things to the Labour office and th th those things would have come out. Um, I think we ought to be honest. The real challenge I find as a person who's worked, I've never worked in government, I've always worked in private sector. First of all, uh, many of us, not just myself, many of us do owe a great deal of who we've become the experiences that we now have to Steve Nirenda, uh, the likes of Angel Piri and Movie TV because at the time the station was starting there was no private TV uh, with that kind of aggression, with that kind of caliber uh, on the scene. Um, you're talking of 2022, Movie TV started around uh, 2002, 2003, um, so 18 or so years down the line uh, you have 56 private TV stations. 56? That is not, and, and you need to always have a pioneer in the business, and, and that's what definitely uh, movie TV did. Um, Diamond TV for me is like an offshoot of the movie TV roots, of the movie TV branches. Everything and the exposure that um, I was given uh, is, is owed to movie TV. Without things like the assignment, there would have been no custom ones and the, 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 this hard aggressive interviewer that people claim I am. So, um, mistreatment, I don't think that's true, uh, really, during my time. The, the honest truth is that sometimes familiarity, like they say, breeds contempt and, and, and people do not want to accept sometimes or understand that if, if maybe we, we are age mates or we started off together and you become my boss, sometimes it becomes a bit personal for me to accept that you are the boss now and, and if you instill discipline and so on, they feel you're vulgar. So they, they, they must, we must be able to draw a line uh, between work and, and, and personal issues. I enjoyed um, my experience and my time at Movie TV. So will many people tell you. Today you look at programs like Impali, 
Frank spent a lot of time producing lots of, you know, productions, Red Bag, Banja, and so on. You look at the likes of Tom and Jovo today and what they're doing. Um, Owas, Re Muape, you know, we, we've worked with so many of these. So for me, movie was like a training ground for so many people. It entirely uh, is personally uh, how an individual will translate or interpret what they pick up and what they make out of it. So to answer your question, uh, whether it's fact or claim, whether I was vulgar to people, I did my job yeah. the best I could. If I offended people, um, I apologize. I still remain very close to many of my former workmates uh, and colleagues. Some have come to join me, so if I was a very bad or vulgar person or mistreated people, how would they come and join or work with me? I still have very cordial relations with Steve Nirenda. Uh, you're aware I've interviewed him a couple of times here in my that. studio yeah. during the debate. Uh, I still go back to do lots of business uh, with movie. I still have close relationships with a number of colleagues, uh, Paul Shalala, Brian Mwale, Chilufia Muelwa, some who I gave opportunities. So. All right. So what is one thing that, since you worked in the private sector, you've, like you've said, you've never worked for, for the government. No. What is the one thing that you took away and when you were become, like, when starting Damon TV and say, this is something that I want to do for my people as well? Or, some, or And another thing that you say, this, I experienced this, I don't want people that are working under me to experience this. Is there one thing that you can say, this, no? Well, in every environment, whether in, in your personal life, in relationships, or in a work environment, there's always mistakes. Uh, I continue to make mistakes. The, 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 the lesson is what do you learn from your mistakes and how do you pick up the pieces? Um, we've been in existence now for five years and uh, rapidly we've grown so fast because I spent eight years um, at, at a very high managerial position as general manager handling lots of things, content syndication, content acquisition, um, rights agreements, uh, marketing duties, uh, editorial decisions. So I knew the whole 360 of how not only a TV station runs from an operational end, but from external relations of how to handle business. Um, and so the many, many billion kwacha mistakes I made uh, under someone's business are things that when I came into here, I said, this we will not do, this we will do. But obviously you need to also look at the fact of looking into the future. Uh, the hallmark of every leader is to be visionary and to see beyond the curve what everybody cannot see. So business is a bit like your Christian faith. Um, you need to be able to see what others cannot imagine and you know, transform it into real life. If, if you can't visualize, if you can't dream, then you're not meant for leadership. So it's through those learning processes. Um, if you want me to be very specific, things like you know, uh, cash flow management and how to enter contracts with, um, with, 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 with clients, but also content um, acquisition and content positioning. If you see what the Diamond brand has, has been about, uh, when we were starting, we looked at what everybody else was offering on the market and realized that um, social media uh, then was the future now the in thing we're going towards an era of a metaverse now so people don't wait for specific times to say 19 hours 20 yeah. hours is prime time for yeah. every time is prime time people wake up at 2 a.m four o'clock in the morning the first thing they touch is the phone so we've we, 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 we've put our brand to be more adaptable to changes around the environment especially around social media hence the launch of of diamond media and our tagline, which is all about reinvention and, and traffic changes. So those are the things I look back at in terms of adaptability and being able to take chances and creating opportunity. Nice. Uh, when, how was Diamond TV born? Was it something that you had worked on for, uh, for years, you had been planning about it, or it, it just happened when you were closer to leaving movie TV? Well, uh, to be honest, I think... Uh, as human beings, we suffer from um, a sickness of procrastination sometimes where you you want to do certain things until something pushes you off the cliff. Uh, and I say this because then we never know what the right time is. Or people say, no, God's time is the best. But I I've heard so many stories of how Diamond started. But 
Uh, there's only one version, um, really. Uh, when you do certain things, um, it's, 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 you know, when you outgrow your environment, uh, it's, it's, it's like if you're in a pot or in a container and you're boiling, eventually you need to erupt yeah. and, and, and just get out. Um, I was not tired of, of, of movie, but at the point where I had reached, there was nowhere else I was going to go. I mean, I was second to the owner of the business. I was not going to be chairman in, 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 in the nearest of years. You assumed that I was partner. So, I mean, I'd scored many successes. Um, I'd done my news past. And I think it was only a point for me to take my experiences elsewhere and go and, go and explore. Because if I didn't do that, um, I think I'd be, I would have been a danger to myself in that I'd have started doing routine work, and that is not growth in life. Um, I still continue doing my journalism practice in terms of interviews once a week every Sunday with my program Costa. Um, I'm working on a new reality show with Presenter Search, which I think for me is a new avenue of what I want to achieve in my life. Um, I always tell myself that you need to have what I call the DPP in life. Uh, you need to have, you need to first of all be driven, you need to be passionate about what you do, and then you need to have a purpose. Why do you exist? Why do you wake up? And why do you do what you do? And I think um, my purpose in life as to why God has given me this talent in media and given me the opportunity to run my own platform is to also give an opportunity to young Zambians. I'm very passionate about young people. Um, I turned 40 soon, so I still consider myself young. Uh, because somebody gave me an opportunity, I think it's my time as well to give other young people an opportunity and let them learn from me and take this thing forward. I, I, I usually get so upset <clears throat> when the journalism profession is looked at as a blalizo profession or yeah. when they're looked at as people who are only good enough for a 50 kwacha transport refund. This is a craft, this is a trade and a profession that contributes contributes greatly towards setting an agenda of the nation but away from the newsroom uh, what we do out of film and content what you're doing right now uh, through media we can promote art through media we can promote fashion and in today's world where we're trying to teach um, talent married into entrepreneurship and adding value it's only through the media that you can begin to reap value out of fashion designers, musicians, artists. Imagine if there were no radio stations and TV platforms. Now social media channels like yours, where would the musicians play their music? Who would interview them? And, and for me, I think that is my passion and my purpose is to let young talent shine like a diamond on my platform. And that's why, apart from just being TV reinvented, we say we're the home of Z pop culture because every celebrity billionaire or millionaire we see out of Hollywood, we see out of Nollywood or Joe Bird now, they had a platform given to them. So that for me is the reason why Diamond was born. I think I had to go into my next challenge in life. And um, yes, it took years of planning because you can't just jump into a business without uh, a plan. So yeah. there's been a very solid uh, business idea behind Diamond from a very long time. Uh, I believe so far we've achieved the aspect of showing Zambians that news is real time and that you have a platform that can guarantee you breaking news on the news front. We are quickly building on the pop culture aspect. Um, so the ultimate plan going forward is that we can be a Pan-African brand and see how we integrate, first of all, starting with Sadiq and other players, content from Malawi, Zimbabwe, but also Zambian content going out there. Okay. Uh, we're working on a number of projects going out to the world. Great. Uh, now that you, you, you talked about um, journalism being looked at, like uh, yeah. Blarizo, whatever, a lot of people, I think, they, they, they say this is how we survive. Like, I want to do Blarizo because our salaries are small. They're very, they can't sustain me. I have to pay rent, I have to survive, I have to go for work. Do you think that's going to change? Do you think there is, uh, are people working towards improving salaries for, especially for private media? 
much for most of them. I've, I've heard that so many times, but uh, that will take us another show for me to really explain <laughs> yeah. um, those challenges. But uh, very quickly to summarize that for you, I think we need to approach this issue uh, on a number of fronts. Number one is from a policy side. Um, first of all, the policy framework is wrong uh, under the environment in which we operate, uh, especially as private media, because um, yes, we are private, so we're not going to cry about TV levy, but the policy should allow that those that are getting taxpayers' money then should leave some space in the market for it to be fair. Um, the licensing framework uh, for free-to-air stations like ours uh, who are not really free to air because the public is not viewing us um, free. They have to pay subscription, yet we need to invest in that content. Um, thirdly, um, issues to do with big advertisers, standardization of rates, and, and who gets the ad agency contracts for, for big advertisers. The market in Zambia uh, is, is, is not leveled. But also it goes to the innovation and business models. We can't just blame everything on the policy and the outside world. It also goes to, do we have a media industry that is established and standardized? For example, if I ask, uh, is there a clear-cut standard in terms of rates? How much should a 60-second spot ad cost in the news? If you go to other markets, that's very clear. But you find on one station it's 5,000 kwacha, on the other it's 500 kwacha. Look at the difference. Uh, some stations start up as religious or community stations. So it's a pastor preaching. Uh, later on, you have volunteers um, working for the newsroom. So they are being paid midi meal and so on. So, so then you've got commercial stations that are designed to operate commercially. Um, what kind of innovative business ideas do you have to take to market? And I think that's where the problem is. Not every station has, has, has been designed on a business model aspect some are community stations some are religious so we, we sort of mistake these things will this change if we if we address those issues that i've mentioned and um, i for one uh, I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of advocating through media owners association and others engaging stakeholders eventually once we create an industry uh, as a player i'm confident that this uh, will change. Okay, uh, so I know you're busy, so let me just move it quickly. Do you believe in um, employing uh, the personnel that you employ? Do you, do you believe they have to have papers, you have to go to journalism school, mass comm, or any other school, or it's just about talent? Like, for me, ob obviously presenting can just be talent, but say somebody has interest in reporting, can you send them to the feuds, even when they don't have papers? No. If you're going to work in mainstream journalism, you definitely need to go through the paces of understanding how to process and treat information. And this is where I always tell the public, because of social media, every Jim and Jack thinks they're a journalist. Yeah. Uh, because I can tweet, because I can be the loudest on, 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 on Facebook, and I become a journalist. And I've got nothing against our colleagues who hide behind selfie sticks and their phones, and they want to, for, to create whatever TV stations they, they are creating. Yeah. But, but, but there's, there's law, there's rules to understand uh, what borders on hardline defamation, uh, what borders on espionage, what borders on uh, inciting you know, the public, what borders on rules that venture on uh, privacy of individuals. Uh, can I just come and shoot your face? In, is it in public interest? Uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, if you ask me, uh, people think journalism is no longer necessary because of social media, because anybody can catch an accident and post it. You still need what is called conventional or traditional journalism right now because the world needs sanity. The world needs... Um, you, you cannot just go where somebody has shot 12 people and start shooting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there's, there's rules to how we process that. And if the world needs responsibility, if the world is going to be shaped towards some sort of, um, uh, you know, sane world, you need trained people. That's why we've got an editorial get keeping. Presenters and talent. There are times when I employ people with the gut feeling, yes, that they are talented, but I always encourage them to have some academic understanding because what we do, you cannot just go and sit in front of a camera and start parroting anything that comes in your mind. 
you've got professors, you've got doctors, you've got lawyers out there who are your audience. Are they going to watch or tune into your show because you're ill-informed or you're ignorant? So you do not need to be a journalist to present, but research and have an understanding over a topic or subject that you're going to present. Even when interviewing somebody, research more about them, understand who they are, what do they like, what are they all about. So for mainstream newsroom and journalism, definitely I'll require those qualifications. But talent without knowledge is useless. Yeah, that's true. Okay, now uh, lastly, or second lastly, uh, during elections, there were rumors that um, you were paid to be biased on certain, with certain individuals. Did you, like, Damo TV is paid, like, okay, this amount, I'm coming, I'm coming to campaign, I, I need you to be a bit biased when interviewing me. Did you, did that happen? Diamond was paid, or who was paid? You. Myself. Yeah. Well, I hear lots of those stories, and uh, 18 years plus in the business, the only thing that uh, makes me sleep consciously uh, without waking up at night is that uh, I, I, I don't go to bed with any politician. I do my best uh, as I can. If we are in the business of selling airtime and if the public cannot understand that that's where we make our money, during a campaign, a politician needs to pay the price uh, to appear on TV. And we have managed to build, a, to build ourselves a brand where even the politicians know that if they feature on Costa, they will get the eyeballs. So we will pay or ask the price for what they, they, they want. Um, but to answer your question very forthrightly, um, I've heard lots of these stories that have been paid by either party X or party Y. And for me, that is what maintains me to be neutral because if the ruling party uh, complains that I'm favoring the opposition, the opposition complains that I'm favoring the ruling, then I think we are objective and really neutral. But we, we, we often uh, do a good job. Um, if you followed our election coverage, we stayed on the fence. We were the only station that brought about uh, 13 candidates out of the, uh, the 16 that were standing into presidential debates live uh, with everybody invited, even some who refused that they were never invited. So we showed that we were not biased. For commercial, interviews or whatever, everybody paid their price according to the rate, but that's not true, you know that. that uh, <laughs> I was paid to be, to, to, to be biased or to be soft on, on anybody. We interviewed everybody that made themselves available. Perfect. Lastly, what is uh, one thing that you can tell the people that are um, aspiring to join the media or they've just started this journey? Um, first of all, it's become even more uh, for, it's, it's, I would say, difficult and easy uh, to venture into this industry. In our times, we did have so many platforms and opportunities. Now, you can simply wake up in your bedroom, switch on your phone, and start talking, not to Zambia, not to Lusaka, but the whole wide world. That's how simple it's become. Mm -hmm. Difficult, because then, the amount of talent out there is huge and people will only put their eyeballs on something that is relevant and something that is worth the while. But young people need to search inside of them to realize what gift God put in them because God gifts all of us. The challenge, and I love the Bible story of the three servants, the two that multiplied their talents and the one that buried, um, is posting pictures of yourself nude talent or you drunk talent we all have nudity like I always say an opinion is like nakedness so I, I, I think talent is that which is unique in you not something that everybody has so for me social media is basically an extended platform of what radio and TV was because now you have an extended version of radio, which is podcasts and audio platform, Twitter spaces and so on, smaller TV on YouTube, you know, Twitter and uh, Facebook, streaming and apps and so on. It's how you harness your unique gift and talent, add value to it, but it must impact people. So at the end of everything that you do, you have this getting candid with Helen. Does sitting down with me 
have an impact on somebody that will watch? Or is it just about you getting the likes and the numbers? And this is where we're missing it because the more greedy or hungry we become on looking for likes and blowing our pages to be the top, whether boosted or not, we lose the value of impacting life. And for me, I think that is what the whole purpose of journalism and media should be to impact somebody's life. Somebody either needs to learn something, be informed about something, or they need to make a life-changing decision based on what they see. So my advice is basically those three things. Harness your talent, discover yourself, be original, use social media to impact positively. Thank you so much. This has been very informative. For myself as well, and I'm sure the, the people that are watching have learned one or two things. Thank you so much for making time to come on the You're show. You're welcome, thanks. Alrighty guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. This was such an insightful interview. So remember to invite your friends and keep subscribing. Bye-bye.